Today, my guest is Professor Tom Carmichael. He's a neurologist and neuroscientist. He's chair of the Department of Neurology at UCLA, and he's an expert on stroke and vascular dementia. And today, I'm going to talk with him about the emerging picture of regenerative medicine, the potential to enhance recovery of patients after they suffer a stroke or perhaps even after they're starting to have memory problems in, in, in dementia syndromes. Tom, welcome. And uh, I'd like you to, to start by giving our listeners and viewers some background on you. Where did you grow up and where'd you go to medical school and, and graduate school? Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to talk with you today. I grew up just north of Los Angeles in Westlake Village or Thousand Oaks. Um, I went to UCLA for undergraduate and then to medical school at Washington University School of Medicine, where I did an MD PhD, and then did a neurology residency there and came to UCLA for a fellowship and then stuck around on faculty. Yeah. And at Wash U, uh, what was your work there, your PhD work? My work there was to understand the higher order processing of smell, uh, which sounds kind of like another sort of perhaps pedestrian sensory tracking uh, experiment, except this was really interesting. It was in uh, non-human primates, and we are very interested in how smell, which is relayed into the frontal lobe, is integrated with other senses and, uh, and with kind of the interior sense of the body in higher order uh, cognitive operations. And what, what methods, so you're looking at connections between neurons in the olfactory cortex and other brain regions, is that right? Yeah, so we mapped using tracers, uh, anatomical tracers, the axonal connections of the olfactory system as it comes into the brain, <clears throat> and then as it's relayed from the olfactory cortex into the orbital frontal and anterior insular cortices, and then how it, is in turn relayed from those areas. Yeah, and uh, smell or olfaction is thought to be the most ancient sense. And in terms of brain evolution, uh, it's interesting that there's kind of some uniqueness to the, the pathways of smell versus other sensory systems, which they tend to relay in the thalamus. And the olfactory system has kind of more direct connections, say, to the hippocampus, for example. That's exactly right. Um, and, and you know this from, you know, your own work. The uh, olfactory system is wired so differently it, to uh, the hippocampal and memory circuits in a fundamental way without a relay like the thalamus. And then also directly into, uh, into affective centers or emotional processing centers like the amygdala, um, and then in, in, the, in the orbital frontal cortex. And so one of the interesting things is that olfaction is quite early integrated with uh, what we call interoceptive senses, like stomach fullness and, uh, mm -hmm. and our sense of blood pressure and, and, and stress, so that it forms a construct of pleasure, an, an ancient way in which we have a sense of our own body's internal workings. And that's one of the interesting things that came out of the work is that uh, just starting off to study how smell is relayed in the brain in macaques, we started to understand that this was likely involved in depression and other affective disorders mm -hmm. and collaborated at the time with Mark Rakel and others to do functional mapping using PET of depression circuits. Huh, interesting. And then, and then you, at some point you kind of switched the focus of your research to uh, disorders, neurological disorders, stroke in particular, what, what prompted that? It was kind of free range grazing, if you will. When I, I finished my PhD, went back to med school and then did a neurology residency. And I really was not set on, on pursuing the next extensions of my PhD necessarily. And so a lot of things were kind of filtering through my head at the time. One was the devastation of neurologic disease in terms of recovery, 
that unlike say the liver, there is very little regeneration in the brain and it limits recovery in so many diseases. And then the second was more my experience as a graduate student where some of, I always felt some of the coolest experiments were done by the developmental biologists. At the time, uh, Josh Sange and Jeff Lickman and Dale Purvis were all at Wash U and were teaching us graduate students. And they were asking these really probing questions and using these great just experiments to understand how the brain wires itself initially and what the cues are. And so I, 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 with my own background in studying connections and now thinking about disease, I, I wondered what's the ability of the adult brain to do some of the things that it did so well in development? And if we could understand that, could we in so, some way manipulate it to enhance recovery? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's something I've been interested in. My, my postdoc work was in developmental neurobiology, studying signals that regulate the growth of axons and dendrites, the growth cones at the tips and, and connections. And I discovered uh, that glutamate plays an important role. Uh, the brain's probably the brain's most important neurotransmitter plays a role before connections are even made in, in controlling the outgrowth of of the uh, dendrites in particular. Uh, so then, in stroke, why don't you give some background on stroke? What happens in the brain? So, in the most common stroke subtypes, a clot from a variety of sources lodges in a vessel. And the brain that's downstream from that vessel is densely ischemic. It has oxygen glucose deprivation and dies. And that occurs really in, in a matter of minutes to hours. And then there's kind of a tidal zone in the tissue next to it, where the, it, this tissue didn't get all of its blood from the block vessel and gets some of its blood from neighboring vessels and kind of uh, blood washes in and washes back depending on the collateral flow and that exists probably for two to three days and is a major target of uh, re, re uh, cannulization or clot lysis or the, the, uh, the, the focus on removing the blood clot. Then after that, the brain goes through a series of secondary injury events where the inflammation triggered by that lack of blood flow plays out, draws in inflammatory cells. There's this wave of secondary damage and then we enter a third phase in which the tissue that survives has uh, received some unusual signals. It's received a wave of reactive oxygen, as we know from any kind of uh, ischemic event, what, that when an organ gets ischemic, it can't handle its oxygen levels as well, and it, get, and it generates free radicals. And so those are present, and they actually signal in the brain um, and then a number of other things happen in this tissue that survives and is adjacent to the stroke that produces a, a brief period of enhanced plasticity, or at least the potential for it. The brain is put into a state where it's more responsive to form new connections. Um, the glial cells are in a, a different state in, in terms of allowing new synapses. And so there's this window of plasticity that occurs after stroke. And the tissue that survives, it's really been an intense focus in my lab and many others. And, and what is that window in, in humans? Is it, no? I mean, is, these are kind of, uh, so this is, these kind of stages following a stroke, what's happening in the brain uh, based both on animal studies and humans, I assume. And so what's this window in humans where there's a potential for enhancing recovery in terms of time? How long of a time? That's a very good question. We have to answer that one using our behavioral measures in humans uh, because we obviously can't go in and trace the connections to see when they grow and when they stop. So using recovery measures in humans, it's really the first three months where there is a very substantial and spontaneous recovery. Almost no matter what you do to a person with a stroke in those three months, they will recover to some degree across many different domains, motor and sensory and cognitive. And so because the recovery is spontaneous and because it occurs across so many domains, we've called that in humans, the sensitive period in which the brain is really plastic and recovering. 
It tails off after about three months, but is still present up to about six months. And then after six months, we hit a chronic phase where recovery is still possible. It just requires an awful lot of work by the patient. And it occurs only usually in the domain that that work is focused on, like using the arm or walking. Yeah, and what, so the brain, uh, the right side of the brain controls the movements of the left side of the body and, and sensory information uh, coming from the left side of the body goes with control L. So the symptoms will be usually kind of on one side of the body mainly. Is that right? For most stroke, that's exactly the case. Uh, about 60% of all human stroke is in a territory of brain arteries that does exactly what you're saying is really this contralateral structure uh, with language and humans also lateralized to the left hemisphere. Ah, uh, okay. And so what, there's also another type of stroke, I guess we should mention where the blood vessel actually ruptures and that's called a hemorrhagic stroke, essentially a hemorrhage of the vessel. And um, it's less common, but it happens. Um, do you want to say anything about that? I, that hasn't typically studied so much in, with regards, for example, to animal models. Yes, that's an, exactly right. So it's, a, it's around a little less than 20% of the range of strokes in the U.S., um, and it's often associated with high blood pressure. The vessel has a little teeny aneurysm that the high blood pressure over time creates, and then that bursts. They're usually in uh, the basal ganglia, um, uh, so subcortical mm -hmm. for the, the uh, brain uh, anatomists out there. And it's been harder to study um, in, in pure phenomenology. Uh, once the blood's absorbed, the recovery is better compared to the non-hemorrhagic stroke. So mm -hmm. there's some initial dysfunction that is simply due to blood squirting through tissue. And then as it's absorbed, people get better. Um, another limitation has been the models in, in mouse and, and, and rat. Uh, you, you would seem to be easy to, to model this. You could just inject blood in. And that indeed is one model and it's okay. Another model, uh, again, sort of for this experimentalists out there is to put a little enzyme in that digests the blood vessel and causes it to leak spontaneously. And so they've been using these models to understand brain hemorrhage in experimental animals and understand how recovery occurs. And they're somewhat limited. Okay. And so in this brain region where there's still neurons alive, apparently, and what during this critical window, what kinds of plastic changes are going on? Are, are the neurons actually some growing and forming new connections? Yeah, th this has been really fascinating. Um, there's two levels to describe this on. The first is the one you just bring up, and that is connections, sort of the structural circuits. And what's remarkable is that the is that if you think of a tennis ball, uh, a, a stroke the size of a tennis ball in the brain, that's a dead area, but there's a lot of brain left. And particularly the brain around it is knows there's a stroke and it's put into a molecular program. It, it turns on and off genes that um, allow it to grow new long distance axons. Um, they'll th allow it to be somewhat resistant to the normally inhibitory environment of the brain that locks circuits down. Uh, it also, allows uh, synapses to be uh, a little more plastic. And um, there may be uh, changes in glial cells that facilitate that in terms of how they modify the molecules in the, in the brain, the so-called extracellular matrix. And then the second level, so that's kind of structural circuits, kind of the circuit board idea. The second question is the thing, thing that happens is, as how are neurons firing? Of course, that's the that's the coin of the realm. How are they sending signals to one another? What's the functional circuitry look yeah. like? And what's really interesting there is the initial stages after stroke, that whole activity pattern is suppressed. The brain turns itself down. And I could describe the reasons for that. And then as it starts to come back, it struggles to get its neurons firing in the same synchrony together to do movement or 
uh, or language or sensation. And so a second element of, of focus in most uh, regenerative medicine studies is to enhance the, uh, the cohesion, the, the, the co-firing of neurons together to reconstruct those neuronal ensembles. And, and so what, what's going on that in the uh, kind of initial stage where the brain's circuits are kind of stunned and their activity decreases, uh, why is that? We know from work in the late 80s and 90s that one of the ways brain cells or neurons die is they excite themselves to death. Um, and you know this very well from your work. And that is that when a glutamate, the major excitatory transmitter is released, it activates a cell, which in turn could cause more glutamate to be released and more excitability. And when you, when, when you get stroke, and a whole bunch of glutamate is released just because of the ischemia and the death and the neurons bursting open, you can get a, 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 an excitatory loop and that's called uh, excitotoxicity. And so it, one of the ways the brain controls the spread of the stroke is to really damp down excitatory signaling. It has a whole lot of systems to do that. In fact, the more we discover about repair and recovery, the more we realize a lot of these repair and recovery systems are actually turned off in stroke because the brain's first response is limit that excitatory signaling. And yeah, and when, neuro when neurons are active, they produce growth factors, proteins that promote the go growth of axons and dendrites and synapse formation and even synaptic plasticity. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the growth factors and that are upregulated following a stroke? Yeah, yes, there's a there's an initial very transient wave of growth factors that are upregulated in using rodent models and in some human studies, things like the neurotrophins, uh, particularly BDNF. They have this very brief, maybe 18 hour wave in which they're induced. And what we tried to ask is what is more sustained? What happens during recovery that could drive it? <clears throat> and we found other growth factors that are turned on later. One is called GDF10 or growth differentiation factor 10. And that turns out to be turned on in neurons that are next to a stroke um, that form a new connection. And, and it can really drive those new connections, both in the dish, you can put GDF10 in and get neurons to give a profusion of new growth. And it also is seen in humans, primate, non-human primates and rodents as in adjacent, in adjacent to stroke. So there's a variety of growth factors that are turned on initially and then ebb, and then some that are turned on later that can stimulate growth and recovery. Uh, it turns out they're just not quite stimulated to the length of time or the magnitude necessary, or we might recover better. I remember in the 1990s when I was studying cultured hippocampal neurons and, as I mentioned, finding glutamate inhibits the dendrite outgrowth. Uh, I found that one growth factor in particular, just called fibroblast growth factor 2 or FGF2, was very good in, in promoting outgrowth and kind of counteracting the excitotoxic effects of glutamate. And in fact, there was a colleague, I don't know if you, Seth Finkelstein? Have you yes, I know Seth pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So at that time, he, you know, he was finding FGF2 was neuroprotective and in, in stroke models. He was even found that uh, intravenous FGF2 could um, essentially re promote functional recovery after stroke, and I think he even did a small clinical trial. I can't remember, it must not have been positive, uh, but this has been one approach over the decades is, can you actually put in growth factors from the outside and enhance recovery? Yes, that's been kind of regenerative brain medicine 1.0 is uh, to try to deliver those growth factors systemically when we know they have an action in the brain and in injured circuits. And 
The problem has been that they are active systemically if you give them systemically. Yeah. Effects on so many other tissues. Yeah. FGF2 had a profound effect on kidney in that trial, and that was a problem. Yeah, I remember at the BDNF you mentioned there was a trial of BDNF in patients with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and they had to stop it because it, they started to have a lot of pain issues uh, because the BDNF actually promotes the growth of these sensory neurons that convey pain signals. So that's another example of a side effect. Um, okay, so why don't you talk uh, a little bit about um, let's see, what should we go to next? Go to some of the regenerative medicine aspect. Uh, you know, so we mentioned growth factors, but you're working on some other approaches to enhancing recovery. Can you, and this is kind of your, a lot of your major work right now. So go, go ahead and, and, you know, give us whatever, 10 minutes on, on that. Th th that's a good question. So a lot of the work is fundamental biology. What's a molecular program in injured neurons that might form reconnection? And we initially thought, well, we'll do transcriptional profiling. Uh, we'll, we'll look at all the genes turned on and all the genes turned off. We'll do a lot of informatic analysis of that. And we'll start to come up with targets that we could turn on that might turn on a growth program. We're still continuing with that, but it's been hard work. Um, it hasn't been quite so straightforward. Uh, and so at the same time, we were studying another phenomenon that came out of uh, what clinicians see. I have another hat where I see uh, stroke re recovery patients. And one of the interesting observations has been that in this spontaneous period of recovery where people just get better, whether they're in rehab or a skilled nursing facility or home, no matter what environment, they get better for, for the first three months after stroke. If you watch those folks, they, they show some of the same patterns of recovery that you see in, in uh, principles of learning and memory. And so uh, mass action, contextual interference, these psychological principles that describe learning also apply to spontaneous recovery and stroke. And so we wondered maybe spontaneous recovery and stroke is using molecular memory systems. And that might be a, a more tractable target for a recovery therapy. And so we started a lot of studies to look at that. Many of these were done in collaboration with Dr. Alcino Silva, who's at UCLA, who does a lot of learning and memory work. Mm -hmm. So we started to kind of pick these apart. One of the first that we looked at was tonic GABA signaling. And so for the audience, they'll recognize that the brain has inhibitory synapses. The GABA is the receptor. And so an inhibitory neuron signals to another neuron and releases GABA. And that's phasic or synaptic GABA signaling. But then there's this longer lasting tonic GABA signaling where GABA is just around. Some of it spills over from the synapse. And because it's around for a longer time, it can kind of set the excitability level of the whole of the whole circuit. The more GAB is around, the more that circuit is inhibited and doesn't get to fire, the less the uh, GAB is around, the more it will fire. We, that hadn't been studied in stroke. And we wondered, does stroke alter this kind of ambient level of inhib inhibition in the brain? And we found out that it did, that it increased it. And this may be part of what we described earlier, the brain's effort to kind of damp down excitability. The problem is the brain isn't really good at stopping that. And so it keeps that damping down of excitability for a long time and it inhibits recovery. And so what initially limits damage persists and limits recovery. So we worked with specific GABA, tonic GABA receptor antagonists, and these are the alpha-5 receptor of, uh, of, of the GABA signaling system and found that if you block the alpha-5 receptor, you enhance recovery in animal models. And this uh, translated to uh, two clinical trials. One, uh, unfortunately, they used the wrong outcome measures in humans, and that's a second discussion. Uh, so it was, it was negative, I think, because they used the wrong outcome measures. But that's an example, Mark, of what 
of one fruitful area to look at molecular memory systems. A second came out of the sort of the king of molecular memory systems, and that's the transcription factor CREB. Yeah. And we started to look at CREB signaling and recovery. And I won't go through all of it in detail, but we found that CREB has a key role in taking neurons that are sort of stunned and not firing together. If you enhance CREB, they assemble back into a circuit that can move an arm or a leg. And the problem is Craig is not, Crab is not druggable. It's present in every cell. And so we started to look at specific receptor signaling systems that get to Crab. And one of these unexpectedly is a chemokine receptor called CCR5, which follows the same pattern. It's upregulated after stroke, downregulates Crab, and downregulates ex excitability in the brain. And if so you block so that, this chemokine, this chemokine is produced by immune cells? It actually turned, yes, that's true. Yeah. It, it actually turns out that the, the receptor side of that is massively induced in the neurons next to a stroke. Huh. So the brain cells next to the stroke, if you just measure the gene expression level or the mRNA, there's this funny artifact in that field where if something's really not turned on in the cell, and then you measure it in a different state and it's really induced, you get these crazy fold inductions. So it's over a hundred thousand fold induction <sighs> in the neurons adjacent to the stroke. They really turn this receptor on and the receptor turns their ability to signal way down. Huh. And so we blocked this receptor, CCR5, uh, using an AIDS drug, which, which it, in a fully independent series of studies, obviously it's HIV, uh, blocks the same receptor. And that turned out to uh, really promote recovery in both TBI and in stroke. And so we have a clinical trial now with the consortium in Canada using this AIDS drug to see if it promotes recovery in stroke. Huh. And so you mentioned that you kind of alluded to some problems with clinical trials and what in stroke and one issue is there's a lot of variability between individuals in, you know, what, what specific vessel is the clot form in, how long's the clot there, um, all sorts of things. Uh, maybe age, sex, and of course, us humans have a lot of um, genetic heterogeneity compared to lab animals. So kind of my interpretation of some of the failures in stroke, for example, go way back to when uh, glutamate receptor antagonists uh, were tried. And then in fact, um, Dennis Choi was probably at WashU when you were there, right? Yes. Yeah. And I've always wondered whether with some of these trials, there could be effect, but you just miss it because there's so much variability between individuals. Yeah, that's a good point. That's hard to deal with. Um, yeah. Of course, we use genetically inbred mice, and uh, and uh, the rats aren't as inbred, but they're you know they're very homogenous genetically compared to humans. So what we can do though is try to align our preclinical animal models with our this would be phase 2b in the in the in the parlance of, of clinical trials our phase 2b stroke trials and their outcome measures in patient selection with our preclinical models and that requires a little belt tightening and stringency on both sides the preclinical models should have a mechanism and a location of stroke that matches those that most commonly occur in humans and then the human trials need to have outcome measures that match what was shown to be efficacious in the rodent. Hmm. So for example, in the human, you wouldn't use some composite outcome measure with language and other things if the preclinical models showed an enhanced gait and, and sensory motor control. You know, you, you wouldn't want to just take what the what you would repaired in the rodent and then just blow it up in the human and look at something totally different. And so I think that's where the field has to really align things. Phase 2B trials in humans to the preclinical modeling in the lab. Yeah. Um, okay, so 
Do you want to talk about stem cells? Do you, uh, you know, you talk about there's events occurring during this recovery period that seem to be somewhat similar to what goes on during normal brain development. And of course, during early brain development, there's a lot of stem cells proliferating and then neurons are born and there's other stem cells that give rise to glia. Um, in the adult brain, there are some stem cells in a couple brain regions at least. And this has been kind of a almost a dream of, of people who study stem cells is that you can uh, have those replace the lost neurons and have the circuits restored. Uh, what, what's going on in the area of stem cell research in relation to stroke? Those are good, very good questions and a great sort of setting of the table for this discussion. There's two categories probably to talk about. The first is what you alluded to, and that's the brain's own stem cells, so endogenous stem cell biology. And the second would be transplant and, the, and that kind of approach. The interesting thing about endogenous stem cell biology is the problem between rodent and human, I think. So I did a lot of work early on in my lab looking at neurogenesis after stroke, and the biology is fascinating. Uh, stimulation of the main of the second main germinal zone in the adult brain, the subventricular zone. Stroke stimulates that in rodents. There's proliferation, and these cells migrate to areas of damage, and some turn into neurons. And it's really an amazing biology. The problem, I think, is that in the human, it's far less certain, and perhaps it doesn't occur at all. Um, so we know from a lot of work from many different labs that the subventricular zone in humans is not like that in the rodent. And in the adult human, there may not be neurogenesis in that zone. And so I, I got worried about that and felt I should probably, I, I decided not to further pursue that in my lab because I worried that for a variety of reasons, this might be rodent artifact. Um, uh, but there are, of course, the, the, you know, the original stem cell in the brain is the oligodendrocyte progenitor cell or yeah. OPC. Yeah. And so here's about 12% of all brain cells and it itself is multipotent and has these fascinating functions that are different than just slavishly becoming an oligodendrocyte. They have all kinds of interesting things they do. So I think progenitor biology in the brain after a uh, stroke or other injuries is still quite a strong and compelling area of study. I just think it's probably should be focused around oligodendrocyte progenitor cells uh, rather than neurogenesis. And the oligodendrocytes, so they wrap around axons and insulate them so that the conduction velocity is increased. And in stroke, what happens in, in what the so-called white matter tracks where there's bundles of thousands of axons coursing you know, from one brain region to another? This has been only recently emerging as a compelling area of study. So we focused on neurons and neuronal cell death for a long time, but up to half the human brain is white matter and stroke dramatically affects white matter. And in fact, if you look at human stroke writ large, if you take all human stroke, say that the, if you look at a clinical trial where they admitted people into the trial who couldn't move their arm, a very common symptom, most of the stroke is actually centered in white matter below cortex. And so we recently really started to understand white matter stroke and what that looks like. And as you indicate, th this is a the niche, the cell signaling environment in white matter are axons, myelin, and the cells that produce those, blood vessels, and, uh, and, their, and their associated uh, cells. And so it's a really different environment. And it's fascinating because they all signal together. And what we're learning is that um, the oligodendrocyte progenitor cell is kind of this key node that can commit and help regenerate white matter by forming new oligodendrocytes and remyelinating injured axons, or it can get stuck and, and won't differentiate and will die. It probably has other roles too that relate to inflammatory signaling and maybe even excitatory signaling. So I think that this is gonna be a fascinating field as it progresses. Yeah, so and then scientists may be working to identify signals that enhance the 
proliferation and differentiation of the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on transplanting stem cells into the brain? I think it's a really interesting field with great potential. It, I think it kind of went off the rails a bit early on. It was very hyped in the press and by some scientists even. And it was, uh, it lacked some rigor in the science and the papers in the sense that, that uh, stem cells were purported to be doing just about everything. Uh, now that we have kind of backed up a bit and reapproached it, I think there's going to be some fairly well-established channels in which it might be used clinically. One would be to transplant cells that become neurons that might replace or stimulate damaged circuits. And there are clinical trials that are in various stages to look at that. Another, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. Another approach might be to take some of the white matter biology we just discussed and transplant glial progenitors or immature glial cells that might enhance uh, myelination or might, um, if they're astrocytes, uh, help um, injured circuits recover. And so that would be another approach that might be interesting. And then a third related field is to combine this with bioengineering where you might put the cells into a, a hydrogel or a biopolymer mm. that helps the uh, stroke has a cavity in it that might help repair uh, the brain and provide a substrate. So it all balance be like putting a biological, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. So the stem cells are producing factors that promote recovery. In some instances, yes, and some, it's uh, it's actually cell cell contact is oh. may not be a soluble factor. Yeah, yeah. and th of course there's been a lot of activity on the excitement about you can take a patient, any person's fibroblasts, put them in culture, manipulate them, change a few genes, and uh, if you do it right, you can get neurons, and even now it's possible maybe even to get different types of neurons. So there's some thoughts of actually taking uh, essentially fibroblasts from a patient, converting them to stem cells, and then using those as therapy. Yeah, so-called, that would be in the term of the field, autologous cell therapy, the person's own cells. It's been kind of a holy grail because then the there's no immunosuppression. You're giving the patient their own essentially tissue back. It's uh, fraught as a late, in, in kind of the late stage consideration. Like do you, when you transform that, what does it look like? Um, have you affected its, uh, its genome in other areas where you didn't intend? Uh -huh. uh, how can you understand its purity, specificity and other clinical aspects? So the late stage translation is where some of the problems lie in autologous cell therapy. Yeah, and I know there are people trying to use a kind of gene therapy approach uh, with stem cells, uh, where actually where you would, for example, cause a glial cell in the brain to turn into a neuron. But That's fascinating. Yeah, the biology there is amazing that you could take one transcription factor and cause a neuron, an astrocyte, to go and and an adult astrocyte and turn into a neuron. It's recently become kind of controversial. There have been some high impact papers that have suggested that some of this may be artifact. However, there are other groups working in it that, that are using uh, different uh, techniques. And so it seems to be a real biological phenomenon. I have a couple, I, I don't do this work in my lab, but I've been following it very closely. One issue to consider is that uh, astrocytes have a really key role in, in the, the so-called brain wound. They form tissue barriers. They help limit the spread of inflammation. Some of them um, are pro-growth. You know, they help with synaptic plasticity. And so I'm not sure that sort of willy-nilly converting astrocytes to neurons is, is, huh. a, is necessarily yeah. a good thing. We'll have to find out. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, vascular dementia. Our dementia in general, you, you're 
become interested in that lately and are doing some work on that. Yes, this is really, to me, an extension of the white matter injury we talked about. Um, vascular dementia is the second leading cause of dementia and co-occurs with Alzheimer's disease and, and Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disease to accelerate those. So it's this common biological problem. And I wondered, uh, you know, there's been this really great effort in the multiple sclerosis field to understand inflammatory white matter injury mm -hmm. and to try to repair the, the, the plaques of MS. And I wondered, you know, these occur in the same geographic locations in the brain as vascular dementia. Uh, could we start to do the same thing with vascular dementia? And one of the first things I found, and others have now found this too, is that the ischemic lesion in vascular dementia doesn't repair like the inflammatory lesion in MS. It's, it, there's really a block in these oligodendrocyte progenitor cells that you don't see in MS. So it's even more of an important biological target in a way. And we've started to work with uh, uh, some of the same tools that we did in neuronal repair to look at white matter repair, asking, is there a molecular profile in, in the white matter that we might co-opt and with drugs to enhance recovery? Uh, we've also worked in stem cell transplantation with some stem cell biologists to understand, could we put an immature glial cell into the white matter that would allow the, that would promote white matter repair? And so that's another kind of tractable approach. We kind of, uh, can you talk about risk factor? Of course, ideally one would never have a stroke or uh, develop vascular dementia. Age, aging is the major risk factor of course, we, we can't dramatically affect that, uh, or maybe we can somewhat. But do you want to talk a little bit about how people can reduce their risk of getting stroke? Yes, this is not um, sort of uh, uh, high-tech rocket science medicine. The main, the main risk factor is age, as you indicate, um, but high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, physical act inactivity, smoking, the kinds of usual culprits that, um, that we can modify are the main risk factors for stroke and for vascular dementia. And an interesting thing is because vascular dementia is so intimately involved in Alzheimer's disease, we recognize that you can actually modify your risk for getting all-cause dementia. And what, if you get it, you can modify the progression of dementia simply by modifying an, an, these, these, uh, these risk factors hypertension, diabetes, obesity, exercise, and smoking. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think we've, did I have anything else I wanted to ask you? Uh, it, it, I guess in a recovery, this, this critical window for recovery that say three months during the first three months in humans after a stroke, this seems to be the time period where there's a potential to, there's some spontaneous recovery, but to further enhance that spontaneous recovery. Have there been any clinical trials of drugs, of other interventions, for example, exercise, cognitive stimulation that have shown positive effects? There have been. One of them is to force the person to overuse their arm and hand if, if that's the main affected part in stroke. And so this was actually many years ago now where they constrained the good arm and forced the person to overuse the bad arm and hand, such as with a sling or a mitt on the good arm. And that's, this worked. And uh, you would think, well, let's just put that in the clinic. And the problem has been that you need enough use, you have to have enough function in the, in the affected arm to be able to use it. Otherwise, you're just going to get fully frustrated as you try to open that jar of peanut butter. Yeah. And so you, and then the other problem is over, the overuse has to be pretty substantial. And some people will get joint pain. Often these are older folks that haven't done a lot of use to begin with. And so, so it hasn't really hit uh, the, um, the clinical, sort of a clinical utility threshold. 
Others have tried to modify physical and occupational therapy to deliver just much greater intensity. And there does seem to be some movement there. It has to be really intense, very patient focused uh, and very integrative with the patient. And so just upping the dose of rehab to a very high level will likely enhance recovery. It, it just is not um, translatable well to the systems of care in American medicine where we don't have the... Yeah. the we don't have it in place to be this intense and individually focused with each patient. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and we're not, we're very weak on preventative medicine. That system's geared to, that's profit driven. And yeah, if, if, if people don't uh, get sick and have disease, then, you know, ideally, we wouldn't need a healthcare system. But <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Tom, well, I uh, very much enjoyed talking to you. It's good to see you and uh, to see you're doing well and to learn about some of your work on uh, in the regenerative medicine during this critical period following stroke. And we'll see what happens in the coming probably decades, the way, the way I think you'll agree, the way these things move it. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's about, you know, this is the way science and medicine work. It takes time. A lot of people, thousands of people, neurologists, neuroscientists working on these problems. Uh, they're difficult. The brain's complex. <laughs> it's not. It's not easy to to correct things when they go wrong. This this wrong as occurs in a stroke in particular. That's entirely true. Yep, it's iterative. Yes. Okay, Tom. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. Yep. Bye.